Hello, my name's Luke Clancy and I'm Managing Editor of Pensions Insight and Engaged Investor magazines. I'm here with Alan Pickering who is Chairman of Best Trustees and is a past Chairman of both the NAPF and the EFRP. Alan was of course featured in Pensions Insight's Top 50 Most Influential People in Pensions and has kindly agreed to be interviewed today. We're going to be speaking about a range of topical pension themes today. Alan, welcome. Thank you. With regards to the current round of pensions reforms, do you think the government is trying to do too much, too quick? Not at all. I'm a big fan of Steve Webb, the current pensions minister. And pension ministers don't tend to hang around too long. They aren't blessed with, with longevity, sadly. And I'd like to see if we could achieve as much as possible while Steve Webb is in office. One of the things that I'm particularly pleased with Steve is that he acknowledges that the, the weak link in our pension system is not private pensions but the state pension and as that's the foundation upon which everything else is built if we don't fix that then it's a waste of time trying to fix the rest. Steve apart the present government is looking at public pensions, private pensions, state pensions, tax, social policy. Never before have we looked at all of those things together. Previous governments, both Tory and Labour, tend to react piecemeal, making policy through the, the rear view mirror, policy which was influenced by yesterday's problems. Yesterday's problems won't be tomorrow's challenges. So I think it's good that the government is embracing the, the broad vista of pensions. There'll be problems because we have a pension system which has been micromanaged by politicians and if we can persuade the politicians to return to the touchline and just ensure that there's fair play, there's bound to be some technical problems by way of fallout but that's a price worth paying for a government which is looking at all aspects of the pension system. You have been critical of auto-enrolment in the past and said the regime is at risk of being unenforceable. Why? You may think it's rather strange for someone like me to be critical of auto-enrolment. I mean, I've spent the last 40 years trying to make sure that everybody who has a job has a pension that goes with that job. And you might say, well, isn't auto-enrolment about that. To an extent it is, but over the years when we've tried to get people into pension schemes, the aim has been to get them into defined benefit pension schemes at a time when the tax regime said that if you missed out on one year's accrual, it'd be quite difficult to make up for lost time later in your career. We aren't in that world anymore. The pensions world is increasingly defined contribution in nature and there are lots of defined contribution savings opportunities out there not all of which come within a pensions wrapper so I'm fanatical about getting people to save but a bit more selective about whether they should save through a pension scheme or through a bank account an ISA an investment trust a unit trust or even through through property the danger with auto-enrolment is that we are saying to every person in Britain, irrespective of their own financial circumstances, that a default savings vehicle for them is a pension. If an IFA were to sit in front of a 25-year-old and say that their default savings vehicle is a pension, even though they might be in debt, have no bank account, have no protection for their their family. If an IFA did that, you'd get banged up. And I'm really worried that there is a disconnect between public policy and the public policy which is imposed on those who sell financial services for a living. We have over a million small employers who are going to be caught up in the auto enrolment net. Many of those employers are here today gone tomorrow. They're employing people who are on lifelong low earnings who themselves may go back to their countries of origin. I just wish that we had an auto enrolment regime that had a, a small business exemption within it and provided a, a greater easement for those employers and employees 
who genuinely felt that savings, yes, but not necessarily savings through a pension scheme. If we are creating such an environment on the basis of a nod and a wink and are saying to certain people, we won't pursue you, we won't prosecute you, that really does seem to me like a, a very wobbly foundation upon which to build law. It's almost, almost like the pensions equivalent of the poll tax, a law which is unenforceable, brings all laws into disrepute. Drawing upon your work at the Life Academy, are you confident that we can expect improved financial literacy to close the defined contribution knowledge gap? One of the things that I'm really proud of is, is chairing the financial literacy charity Life Academy. What Life Academy believes is that financial planning and life planning should go hand in hand. The first challenge is to get people to plan their lives, plan for today, plan for tomorrow, plan for next week, and then calibrate savings strategies that fit in with that life plan. The danger with, with pensions is that we're expecting people to, to think 30, 40 years when it comes to finances, but only this week, next week, when it comes to life planning. We can bridge some of that gap by improving financial literacy, but financial literacy will only help people know that they have to save, understand the opportunities to save, and understand some of the pitfalls like if it looks too good to be true, then it is too good to be true. I don't think financial literacy can convert people who have skills, skills in areas other than finance. We can't convert those people into do-it-yourself financial experts. Therein lies the road to ruin. We don't expect financial experts to do their own plumbing. Why should we expect plumbers to become classic financial advisors. Moving on to investment issues, do you think the sovereign debt crisis is something that should be keeping trustees awake at night? I think the recent financial crises of which sovereign debt funds is but one element has forced us all to look again at things that we took for granted. We've got to think how guilt-edged are government IOUs. Are some government IOUs more guilt-edged than others? But the thing that I find really fascinating is not just sovereign debt, but sovereign wealth funds. One could argue whether governments should have wealth at all. One can question whether sovereign wealth funds are wealth that belong to the sovereign or wealth that belongs to the people generally. But those sovereign wealth funds are playing an increasingly important role in the world of investment. Some of those sovereign wealth funds are buying sovereign debt from other governments, the Chinese keeping the American exchequer afloat. Some sovereign wealth funds are co-investors with us. They are buying the same stocks and shares that we as pension trustees are buying. They are co-investors when it comes to, to infrastructure and they are often buying the plan sponsors of our pension schemes. I don't think any of us has yet really come to terms with the challenge that we are faced by having, having sovereign wealth funds, either as co-investors or as owners of the business that sponsor our, our, our pension schemes. In your previous roles as chairman of the NAPF and the EFRP, is there anything you would have done differently? I was honoured to be chairman of both those organisations. It's difficult to think what I would have done differently or better. But I guess in terms of the NAPF, I perhaps wish I'd used the position of chairman of NAPF to try and bring together some of the voices of occupational pension provision in the UK. There are too many voices, all well-meaning organisations in their own right, but I think we could have achieved a lot more had we worked closer together. I think so far as the EFRP is concerned, I think I should have tried to make sure that there was a, a greater awareness in the UK of how 
people in Europe do pensions. We used to be very uh, arrogant in that we thought we did things right and the Continentals did things wrong. We do things wrong and they do some things right. And I just wish that I'd uh, leveraged the opportunity for, for mutual learning. But Luke, I don't really want to say anything bad about my time at the NAPF or the FRP because it was wonderful. I'm a very lucky person to have worked where I have, to work with the people that I've worked with and to have a job that uh, is both worthwhile and enjoyable. So I'm not going to express regrets about everything I've got. I wouldn't have had a wonderful life and there's a lot more life left in me yet, hopefully. Luke? What is your position on European plans for Solvency II style buffers for pension funds? One of the areas where there is scope for dialogue between the UK and the rest of Europe is the amount of security that backs a promise made by an employer or by a financial institution. We can't have risk-free pensions. They are unaffordable. It's a case of how much risk do we take and where does that risk lie? I think on the continent, they have gone for very stringent rules in backing financial promises, almost to a point where those promises are so expensive that they are not cost effective. In the UK, we've been a bit, a bit more laissez-faire, and when it comes to pensions, defined benefit pensions, we have relied heavily on the employer covenant. I think there is scope for us and the rest of Europe to have a, an open debate about how much backing should financial promises have, what role is there for the employer covenant, and to what extent is that employer covenant a real substitute for tangible, independent, unrelated assets. Alan, it's been a pleasure meeting you again, and thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me, Luke. This has been the third in our series of interviews with the top 50 most influential people in pensions. More to come soon.